This is Pandora's box. As many of you will remember, she was told not to open up this box, which contained all the diseases of mankind. She did anyway. They all escaped. And just as she was about to close it, she heard one little plaintive voice, and that was science. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk to you about some of the science. And just to, to frame this for you, there are going to be three major points. The first is, and, I th and Fergus really alluded to all of these points, although I'm going to try to prove to you that you can have your cake and eat it too. You can talk about acute as well as chronic diseases. Is one is globalization of travel and trade, encroachment into wildlife habitats, and consumption of bush meat increased pandemic risk. The second point is very optimistic, and it suggests that the risk can be mitigated or even eliminated if we invest appropriately. And lastly, consider infections when you think about chronic diseases. Now, the best way to introduce this topic is to use this film. How many people are going to die? Where Steven Soderbergh and well, Scott Burns have very eloquently described the pandemic. The population so I'm just going to use two minutes of my time novel like this. to have no Lawrence seen it and Kate 1 of America. and Jennifer of the and others world. talk about this. How many people are going to die? Well, in 1918, 1% of the population died from Spanish flu. It was novel, like this. No one had ever seen it before. 1% of America? 1% of the world. With the new mutation, we are predicting an r naught of no less than four. And without a vaccine, we can anticipate that approximately one in 12 people on the planet will contract the disease. So at this point, I think we have to believe this is respiratory. Maybe fomites, too. What's that, fomites? Uh, it refers to transmission from surfaces. The average person touches their face two or three thousand times a day. Two or three thousand times a day? Three to five times every waking minute. In between, we're touching doorknobs, water fountains, elevator buttons, and each other. Those things become fomites. That was an extraordinary experience. I put three years of my life into helping to make this film because it was clear that this was the best way to give a lecture to not 100 people or 200 people, but to literally millions. And if there are any questions about what it's like to make films, I'll be happy to tell you about that as we move on. So over the past 20 years, there have been a wide range of infectious diseases that have emerged. Initially after 9-11, when the Twin Towers were attacked and we saw anthrax and people were concerned about smallpox, the largest investment that was being made, at least by your government, by our government, was really in thinking about bioterrorism. But it became very clear that the, the best bioterrorist, of course, was Mother Nature. So we really have invested in thinking about all the different agents that come to us from all over the world. Now, this is a New Yorker's way of looking at the world. And I'm just going to talk here about air travel for a moment. You can reach over 70 countries by a nonstop flight. We have over 190,000 flights per year. 21 million passengers coming in through JFK alone. So if you talk about London Heathrow, you have the same situation, or any other major international airport, which means, in fact, that you can get from anywhere in the world to any other place in the world within a matter of about 14 hours. So there's no longer any sort of us and them. Everything is everywhere. 
In addition, we ship foods all over the world. And so you can see here pathways of pork and beef and products and so forth. Vegetables again, but I only have 15 minutes to present all this data. And this is just the legal trade of which we know. We also have an illegal wildlife trade, and I'm not talking here about pets, but bushmeat are extraordinary. So we have roughly 80% of the protein consumed in Central Africa is bushmeat. And recently we've begun looking at what comes in to the United States. This again is just looking at JFK. We now have 12 active sites. We're collecting materials and you can see heads of primates here. We've been able to find RNA viruses and DNA viruses and bacteria. Fortunately, nothing yet has been viable, but it's really only just a matter of time. Now, life can change very, very rapidly. This is SARS. You heard that described a moment ago. In 2003, the, uh, the government in Hong Kong had this advertising campaign that said, Hong Kong will take your breath away. You may remember this. This was literally the month before SARS was described. And I went there in the invitation of the Chinese government. Some of you may recognize Chen Zhu, who is currently the Minister of Health. And in fact, when I returned, I was ill and I was quarantined, so I know what that feels like. Many of the pictures that we depicted in, in Contagion were drawn from that experience. Now, I'm going to try to give you a sense about how we bring science to address outbreaks. There is a free service called ProMed Mail, which you can access, which will give you daily downloads of whatever's happening anywhere in the world. It's a fascinating site, and there's no cost for subscribing to it. Shortly after we became the WHO Diagnostic and Surveillance Center, we were asked to investigate this particular outbreak where there was a travel agent who went on safari and she became ill. She was airlifted from Zambia to South Africa. En route, she infected a paramedic. The nurse who received her at the other end, the person who cleaned the room, all four of these individuals died. This nurse, who took care of these three people, became ill and she received a drug called ribavirin based upon the science that I'm going to show you in a minute. Now, even if you think about Ebola or smallpox or anything else, this is the most lethal infection that I've ever seen. Minimum 80% morbidity and mortality. Now, what we try to do is to sequence the genomes of these agents, and we present it in an Excel spreadsheet so that anyone with any sort of knowledge, clinical medicine, basic science, microbiology, can sort out what's going on. And we look at the entire tree of life. So we look at the fungi that are present, the bacteria, the viruses, and when we get to the level of the viruses, you can see that they all fall into one sort of category. And that was indeed what allowed us to recognize what was present, why she was ill, to select the appropriate drug. Now, it took months to figure out why we had SARS. This was solved in 72 hours. This is the sort of response that we need. Now, when I began doing this kind of work in the 1980s, this took years. Now, in a matter of months, literally hundreds of viruses. Now, there are many, many more to be discovered. If we have 50,000 vertebrate species, each with only 20 viruses, that means there are a million viruses yet to be found. So we have to find some way to focus. The approach we've done is to look at various places without, around the world and to generate heat maps. So the greater the risk, the more red. And what you see here, Central Africa, we have bushmeat, you know, in, um, in uh, Southern Asia, parts of China and so forth. And what we try to do is make decisions about where and how to focus the investigation. Now, in different parts of the world, you have different bases for risk. So again, in Central Africa, you have bushmeat consumption. You have the same issue here in China. But in the developed world, you have other things like uh, antimicrobial agent use, so overuse of antibiotics resulting in resistance and so forth. But this then allows us to focus the kind of work we do. Let me give you a couple of examples of discoveries to show you how this works. We've been doing a lot of work in Bangladesh looking at materials that come out of bats. Bats are enormous reservoirs uh, for all sorts of infectious agents. And in this instance, we found a virus that was very closely related to hepatitis C. This infects 200 million people worldwide and is a very common cause of liver uh, failure as well as uh, liver cancer. Only a short while later, looking at dogs in the United States, we found a virus that was even more closely related than the first one. So sometimes we have surprises. I mean, this is the way it is in science, and this is what makes it fun to do. So the closest relationship we've been able to find thus far to hepatitis C is, in fact, in dogs. Now, we've also begun looking at seals. We look at pigs, and we use pigs in contagion, but 
seals turn out to be a very interesting intermediary, particularly for influenza viruses. There's been a die-off of seals in New England, and, and as we began to study these, what we found was that they had an influenza virus called H3N8, which typically found in dogs, horses, and birds. And you can see here in the section of the lung through this animal where you see that orange staining is where the virus is located. Now, we found out only today that the same receptors that are present in birds and in mammals are also shared in various regions within these seals. So now we know that seals can be intermediaries, therefore, for distribution of these viruses and movement of them into the human population. Chronic illnesses, too, are a major issue. So I'm just going to give you a couple of examples, three examples, really. Uh, the first one is Helicobacter pylori and peptic ulcers. When I was training in medical school, we were told that stress was the big issue with ulcers. You remember that, Peter. It's not that long ago. And then Marshall and Warren in 1982 found these bacterium in the GI tracts of individuals and demonstrated, in fact, that this was the cause of ulcer disease. We know that hepatitis B and C are the major causes of liver cancer. And more recently, Zerhausen, who received the Nobel Prize in 2005, 2008, for the recognition that papillomaviruses can cause cervical cancer. This means now that we have chronic diseases for which we can develop vaccines. And I don't have time to talk much about vaccines, but I think this is something that will, is probably the only thing that we can really afford as the world gets larger and larger. Now, if you look at a whole range of different infectious diseases, potentially infectious diseases, there are some intriguing clues for MS, diabetes, schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disorder, what we call chronic fatigue syndrome, what you call myalgic encephalomyelitis, and so forth. Now, the most interesting thing that I remember from the days when I was training here in 1977 was the potential link between infection and schizophrenia. And I was asked originally, as I began doing this kind of work, to focus on one particular agent called Borna disease virus. But it becomes clear that there are a whole range of infectious agents that might be implicated in terms of increasing risk, suggesting that in fact it's not any given virus, but rather some sort of host response. So a way of integrating the genes of the host, the environmental factor, seasonality, and so forth. Let me give an example from an animal model. So here we have a track tracing. We actually monitor the amount of time that an animal spends running around a cage. So this is an animal that's normal. It hasn't seen any virus, and you can see that's what we call our normal tracing. That's what we'll call background. Now, this animal sees H1N1 influenza, garden variety influenza virus, halfway through gestation, like the beginning of the second trimester. The animal with, is withdrawn and hides out in the corner of the cage. Here's the control, looks fairly simple, but here now we're looking at gestational day 16, the end of the second trimester, and the animal is hyperactive. The point here is it's the same genetic background, the same exposure, but a different timing, resulting in a profoundly different effect. Another example, this is an animal that's prone to autoimmunity. It's seen streptococcal infection, it's seen streptococcus, very, very common. And this animal develops these repetitive behaviors. So increasingly, as we think about chronic diseases, we need to consider again the role of infection. So again, I've tried to highlight three points. First, using the film, globalization, encroachment of the wildlife habitats and bushmeats increases pandemic risk. Secondly, the risk can be mitigated through investment in science and public health. And lastly, and this is probably the most revolutionary, the chronic diseases may be due to cryptic infection. And again, I thank you very much. I've only had 15 minutes. Please view all of our text there at that website, and you'll find links to all sorts of interesting stories. Thank you very much.